Hello there. Um, let's do something. I'm here for your sake, so I need to ask you about something. It's hard to see you here, actually, and it's like moving. So I need to ask you, how many of you are entrepreneurs? Arms? How many of you are uh, investors? Uh, you don't want to be, you're ashamed to be an investor, or? Uh, <laughs> okay. And how many of you want to be entrepreneurs? There's also a few. I met you for before, so that's cool. You also want to be, okay, but that's good, Ian. So, it's more people coming in. So what we can do in the meantime, I think we're going to get to know each other. Why don't we stand up? Please, stand up. We need some energy. You've been sitting and listening to something. Okay? Everybody turns to your left. That way. Okay? Everybody. And then some massage on the person in front of you. Come on, guys. Yeah, yeah. Help. Energy. Okay, come on, girls down there. What is this? You... And then we turn the other way around and we give it back to the person who gave you some massage. You see, now you know each other. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Great, now we're awake. Okay, I'm here for you, so um, you can ask me anything you want, whenever you want it. You can argue with me, you can do anything you want. Um, I am going to tell you, as I call it, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Let's start with the good news. We are what we do. What do I mean with that? Isn't this a great event? And in this event, you have a lot of people who walk the talk, and I think that's exactly what it is. A lot of leaders in the world do not walk the talk. Do you remember Bobby Sege yesterday when he talked about, give us some people who is great leaders in the world. The list is very short. So I, I think most leaders, and, and the company I worked for before I started my own company, that company had a great leader in some respect, but he did not walk the talk, and that's why I want to walk my talk. Okay? So this is me. Very small boy, started out in Sweden, and basically were looking for my own happiness. My father died when I was five years old, so I do a short version of, about me. And... Uh, I wanted to run out in the world, I wanted to be successful. So, a little bit of work, I understood that my own insecurities is what drives me, and I think it's what drives most of you. There's something that drives us if we are an entrepreneur, or whatever we are. And these insecurities, I'm the best dreamer in the world, so you know that. I dream a lot. I dream about something that's going to happen tomorrow all the time. That's the biggest problem with me. It's always about tomorrow. And then, if you can get these dreams into some vision and do something, then you should be successful. So I became so-called successful at some stage. And then I thought I was going to be happy. And I was not happy. We had a session before today about failures. How many of you in this room have actually failed once? Wow, that's impressive. We have had a good training this day. <laughs> I'm the expert of failures. I want to write a book about failures. And Ian Fairservice, who is sitting here and has more publishing, publishing, he said to me, and I will publish that book and it will be a failure. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably true. So let's see if I can get this. Now something happened here. What? Please. Plop. Okay, that's how I looked. If I have a tie then you know I'm in financial problem. What's happening? Oh, I'm sorry. So if I, if I have a tie, uh, when I came to Dubai, I came actually to Middle East uh, 86, 85 actually, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Then I worked as a decorator for IKEA. I moved 80, the next year to Kuwait as a decoration manager, not because I was good, only because nobody wanted to go there. And my girlfriend became my wife came with me, and she was a decorator because, again, nobody wanted to go there. And the owner of IKEA in Kuwait became like my mentor, my father, because he had only two daughters. So I stayed, and everything disappeared. And in Kuwait, we lived there when the invasion came. We lost everything. And I paint, and we lost everything in our house except my paintings. Do you know how that feels? 
They took everything in our house. They took the tiles away from the walls. They took everything except my own paintings. I think the rock is a very bad, bad taste, but if you think something else, I don't know. They actually didn't take my paintings. I think it's censorship. So really, I came back, me and Eva, my wife, came back to, to Kuwait. Kuwait was changed. We stayed two years, and then I woke up in the middle of the night, 1993, and there was a little angel sitting on my bed. How many of you have seen angels? Wow, I have a big mission to tell you around. They come in different sizes. This was approximately this size. It was female, it sat on my bed. This is Kuwait, so no drugs, no rock and roll. And the angel basically told me, and they do this ment you know, mentally, he said to me in my head, you have a mission for you. I look at my wife, she doesn't wake up. Women never wake up in the night. Have you thought about that? Thunderstorms, anything, they just sleep. So, no help. So I said, w with what? And I said, I have a mission. What mission? You have to save the world. From Ikea. <laughs> so we moved to Dubai. And as I said before today, I was naive and stupid. I didn't know there was no bankruptcy laws here. I had no idea that if you don't pay your bills, you go straight to jail, you don't pass by, go and pick up your money. And I continued, and nobody believed in me. If you come to my office, you're going to find all the letters from the banks and the people who actually wrote uh, no thank you to me. There are quite a few. They're sitting on the wall in the reception. I tried to get some of the local friends to me now to write backdated letters, but uh, they don't do that. And we got it up and running, and if you saw the picture before this one, you know, that was all the products. I, I got it up and running in the, in the last minute, and we opened the first store in 1996 in September in Abu Dhabi. Um, I would not want to be in Ikea. What does it look like? That was, by the way, two containers of products. And we had 6,000 square meters. If you know my store in Jumeirah, that's 2,000 square meters. Do you understand the panic I had? I didn't know how to fill this place up. I had no money, because no banks gave me any money. I got it up and running, uh, that was the first product. Isn't that a lot of feeling? It's, it's, it's a gratin. <laughs> and isn't it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's so much shelving. It's like supermarket. And even my furniture was suicidal. They hanged themselves. I had a girl working with me since 86. She said to me, a decorator, she painted the walls extremely ugly. She's still with me, and she said, Thomas, I said, why do you do this? And she said, because your furniture is so ugly. And you know, there were no people coming to our store. It was outside Magda Bridge in Abu Dhabi. And what we did, we bust housewives from Dubai up there for lunch and back again. So we told managers, this week is your turn. Get in the bus. You have to sing and dance, do whatever, entertain them up to Abu Dhabi, and take them back again. But it's pretty bad to be colorblind. <laughs> it's romantic, isn't it? Anyway, it took up to 2002 before we, and there's a million of stories. I'm going to write a book about failures. I am a perfect example about falling forward. Falling forward every time you do a mistake. And um, we started to understand something, and that was about theaters. I am not selling products, I'm selling feelings. If you sell products, you're in the commodity business. IKEA is a commodity business. I don't want to be in commodity business. I want to sell feelings. So we started to understand that if we're going to be different and reach my dream, we really need to make our stores to theaters. And I think this is the most clever thing I've ever come up with in my life, and I'm kind of walking around so both all you can see it, but that's really it's about, it's not what you buy, it's when you come home. How many handbags do you have? Yes. Truthfully, a lot. And shoes? Only? Is that truthful? Is your husband beside you? Do you need another handbag? In reality, you don't do it. But you buy things to feel good, don't you? And sometimes we buy them and we actually feel bad because they're too expensive or we don't use them. 
So you either shop things because it's emotional, or you shop because it's a commodity. I don't want to be in commodities about a kilo. It's not, an, uh, it's not a fun environment to be. I have no education, I always say. I have though, not an MBA, I have an MBWA. And you're clever, so you know what that means. Managing by walking around. There is nothing better as an entrepreneur or any businessman to know what's going on in the company than being in the company the whole time. I have no education, as I said. I don't think, I think business in general is built upon common sense. So, but I have a lot of titles. And if you pick my cards, I have four different cards. I'm either emotional or empathy or enlightenment or evolution manager. Why do I have these titles? These are four things I think every leader of a company should be. They should be emotional, they should be having empathy for the people and the customers, and they should be taking the company further. And to do that, you need to enlighten customers, for example, about things they don't know anything about. And it is an evolution. It is to go forward. Otherwise, again, you're back in the commodity business. And that's what suddenly hit me. Does the world really need another retailer? No. We don't need another retailer. It doesn't make you more happy. It doesn't make me more happy. For the people who want to be business people or entrepreneurs, you can learn this anywhere. You have to come up with a vision. A vision must have a plan, otherwise it's just a dream. In our case, if you look at the left side, that's fixed as long as I own this company. That's the core purpose. And I'm just going to give you the core purpose. I think that's very important. It's to change the world together. Look at the bottom, please. That's Mr. Bin Bush. Why is Bin Bush there? Because he's the worst, the two worst leaders in the world. But more important, they need each other. And why do I say I have to save the world from Ikea? There's nothing better than to be an underdog. Remember that. Virgin, British Airways. So we have to change the world. In the core values, every employee in my company gets hired to live the core values. They are love, live, believe, and dare. We use them in everything we do. We use them in... Every, in everything from when we hire people till we do any kind of, of training, we do it in advertising, we do it in each appraisal, and we really mean it because it's not a core value if you don't live it. Every time I get banks into my office, there's always like two, three people. Big boss gets here very often, small boss here. And I look at the small boss and I say, do you know the core values? of your company, of your bank. Oh, I, I'm not going to shoot you. So I look at the boss. Do you know them? And do you think there's a bank who remembers their own core values? Zero. The boss immediately starts to look at the other guys and say, okay, help me out here. There are four, I think, uh, um, integrity. Every bank has the word integrity. Is the bankers here today? And no bankers? I'm really sorry, but... You did something bad in your past life, I think. No, but integrity is something you should have in every business. It's not just banks. But you should know your core values, or they are just posters sitting somewhere, so skip them. Brand promise. We have three brand promises. Always different. Always different means that everything we do, we should think differently. Because I want to be different. I don't want to be like everybody else. That's number one. Number two is that every time we do... We want to be a company, a brand, something that people look up to. And to do that, we need to be first, we need to be ahead of the game, and the only way to be ahead of the game is to think differently. Not for just for the sake of thinking differently, but to come up with new ideas. Because that was the first thing I did and when I became an entrepreneur. I do not want to continue to do the same thing. The second brand promise is always limited. I do believe the young generation, some of you here who feel younger, you want to be individuals. You don't want to have the same sofa as your neighbor. You, don't, you want to express your personality. I heard a very cool radio ad, some, which is very seldom I hear them, but this one saying, we are born originals, why dress like copies? 
I, I mean, why your home should be a reflection of you. So we have a promise there that if anything you buy from us in furniture and your neighbor have the same piece, we will change it automatically if you want. And we buy new things all the time because my business is a very boring, slow business. And I want a home fashion business. I want it to go quickly. So always limited. And then we have the last one. It's never expensive. And I have that one because we are a contradiction. And that's what's so cool. We want to look expensive, feel expensive. But when you look at the price, it's kind of, wow, cool. It isn't expensive. Then we have the BISC. And all of you, of course, have MBAs in this room, etc. So you know what the BISC is. Yes? Yeah, it's a big, hairy, audacious goal, but I cannot pronounce audacious. And I don't know what it means. I'm pretty sure that half of you doesn't know what it means. So we changed it to something much more simple. A big, hairy, scary goal. And it should come a little <clears throat> into it also. And the big idea really is, if you're going to change the world, it's about education. So my dream is that we're going to have 99 stores or theaters, 2020, and we're having 99 schools, which means villages, because you need to help the village to help themselves. We're not going to talk so much about that, because this is not about social enterprising. But the, I, we started in Kenya, and you can go on our line, because Wonder World, and you can see it, and every second week there is a film coming in, so you can see what's happening because I want to see where my money goes. My, su my suppliers are involved, and soon I'm going to take the customers involved. So what we're doing to feel good about ourselves and to have a much more important role in life is we hire challenged people in the stores. And the challenged people in the stores, we do because I hired a handicapped boy, which is po politically incorrect to say, but I hired him eight, nine years ago. And I did that because I want to feel good. How simple. And I felt good, especially when his father, his Palestinian, still with us, when his father came up to me and he cried, I felt even better. Totally egoistic. And then the store manager, who had worked a long time with me, she called me one day and said, Thomas, you need to come and see what's happening here. And when, she came, when I came there, that boy had changed the whole attitude of that room. He was in stock control. In that stock control, there had been quite a lot of problems. And since he came, they had stopped. So he taught us more than I thought we were going to tell or teach him. So the goal is to have 5% of all our stuff in our stores, in the front of the store, in the back of the store, it doesn't matter where. And now we're taking that to another level. But 5% of all our people should be challenged because I think they give much more energy in most cases, more than my normal employees does. And it's all about good energy we're talking about here. Then that actually led to, have, have you you've seen the film, um, what's it called, Pay It Forward, you've probably seen that. If you haven't, you should see it. They, my people in my stores really wanted to do something, and that became, I don't, you know, the moms and the pops, the small shops wherever you come, if you go to America, you go to England, they're dying. It's all this big, big Walmart, and et cetera, taking up, eating up this world. And that's horrible. We need to save the world from them. So local volunteering is something that each store does so they get into the local community. And the last piece up there, we have a very small goal, is the global education. How do we change the world when it comes to fanatics and, 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 and the bad stuff that happens in this world? And that's the only way to do that is through education. I call it social responsible investment. I hate CSR. Bad word. I don't hate anything. But CSR, corporate social responsibility. It sounds, corporate is a word I obviously don't like. Secondly, you know, it's like a responsibility. All of you, most of you here have kids. I have three daughters. And there's a world out there that they're going to take over that we have seriously screwed up. So I think that's a better word, social responsible investment. It's an investment in the future. So the good news, your success is determined on how many people you serve and how well you serve them. Isn't that kind of common sense? That's what I think what most people have talked about these days, yesterday and today. It's all about how many people you serve and how good you do it. Let's go to the bad news. What do you think the bad news is? Because everything I talked about before, everything of that you can learn in a business book, couldn't you? 
You can put that together, going to some business schools and, and dream about it. Well, what about the bad news? What is it you can't fake? Any ideas? It's a very... You can't fake authenticity. And you can for sure not fake passion. So if you want to be entrepreneurs, what is it you need to dig into yourself and find? It's what you're passionate about. Nothing extraordinary in the world have ever been achieved without passion. If that is cooking or making love, no reaction. <laughs> without passion, it's not. It's, passion is everything, guys. And having passion, you must be yourself. You can't play another game. There was someone talking yesterday about if I'm an entrepreneur and people investing in me, but I want to do my thing. And the problem, of course, is the investor wants his thing. How do you find that to meet? Because I can tell you, I have no 10 years plan, except I have a dream about 99 stores. There is no 10 years plan. I love the crisis. The crisis kicked my ass so hard because I was up in the sky with a big balloon head. I was arrogant and I was lazy and I was bored. Because before the crisis, everything sold. And I, my management made decisions where I allowed, so it's my fault, it's not them. I was involved in them and I took the easy way. But it was things that were against my stomach feeling. And I was angry, and what I was angry about, I was angry at myself. That I wasn't true to myself. And if you want to talk about them later on, I can tell you about many of them. So many years ago, six years ago or something, I said to my management, I've come up with these four words. I think that is what business is about. But I only understand two of them. <laughs> and it's true, I only understood two of them. But I was sure this was the word about the future in any business. Emotional, okay, you already got that. I'm an emotional person, that was easy for me. If we sell feelings, you can have a higher price, you can do things, you can have a higher salary for your people, you can do good in the world, you care about your supplies, etc. Et you get that. That was easy. Spiritual. You must have a meaning. There must be a meaning with your company. It must be a reasoning for why you have a company. Because otherwise you don't get the best talent in the world. You don't get your people excited. You don't get your customers excited. At that stage we call it, we want fans. We have gone further now. But what is seamless? Any idea? Seamless is all the business, all these hardcore things that you learn in business school, I think, because I haven't been there, how things are supposed to work, that everybody's on the same boat, you go in the same direction, that the cog wheels goes together, that everything works. Does it make sense? And there's a lot of things that can go wrong. We have 750 employees right now. We have 14 stores for $100 million, and I can tell you there are a million things that go wrong. Murphy's Law, you know that one. But what about weightless? Can someone give me that one? You're such a quiet group. I should dance for you. We feel good about it. Mm, yes. Did you feel good about it? It's also in the spiritual, I would say. Weightless. It's what psychologists would say in the flow. When things just work, you know how it is. Your relationship or anything works. It's just so easy, isn't it? It's just, ah, you just found balance. And what happens when you find balance? The only thing you can do is to lose it again. And that is what life is about. So, isn't it? My future, your future, any company's future is about your customers. They own the brand. We want them to be evangelists. Because in the social networking area you have today, they write about you, they write about me, they own me. If they don't like something we do, they will write it, it's out on the net. It's not yesterday. What do I want to work for me? Who do I want in the company? The best talent. And talent, and for you who have kids, you know, they're not gonna work in a company they don't respect. They're going to work in companies they respect. And customers who can afford it will buy things in companies they respect. 
Otherwise, go to plan B, which is commodities. That's plan C, actually. C for commodities. So, here's the hard part. It's by person, one at a time. It's like relationships. I think it's the same thing to have dogs, children, and employees. A little off there, okay? I want someone to challenge my dog there. Do you know dogs and wolves? They are social animals. Do you know the only animal on this planet that's more social than dogs? Us. We're the most social creature on this planet. Would you want to work in a company where they say, where are you working? I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk about that. No, it's the same as your family. You want to be proud of where you work, don't you? You want to be proud of your family, of your, your pack, your group. And the point is, I also think that business is like marriage. When you're walking by our stores and you see an ad or you see this window, we flirt with you. When you get inside, we got the date. If you buy something, we got engaged. And then, if you're coming back again, we have got married. And what about marriages today? Over 50% ends in divorce. So how do you stay? Because your relationship will evolve. And if you look at our relationship, we lost it before the crisis. We were not sexy anymore. Our products wasn't cool anymore. The feeling in our stores wasn't good enough anymore. Now you come to the one 3.0, I call it, in Jumeirah, for example, and we're rolling it out now. Now it's sexy again. Now it is edgy. Now it is fun. And our people who work in the stores love it again. And you can feel it. And that's good energy. And if you don't have good energy, you will leave the stores, whatever store you walk into. So the bad news is not so bad, is it? Because it's really the most valuable gift you can offer is an authentic yourself. Yourself. And ask yourself if you are a wannabe entrepreneur or into another business or if you are really investing money. Are you doing it for the right reasons? Because you can't fake passion. And with passion you can move mountains. So I think it's all about my happiness is to, I found my purpose. I'm trying to live it every day. I say try because it doesn't always work. And then I get these small glimpses of happiness. I don't have it all the time, but I get it. Here and there. So, and we call it the power of one. Every one of you can do a change every day. Every employee I have can do a change every day. You can make a person smile when they walk into a store when they're in a bad mood. That's a good one. So, what questions do you have? Yes, please. I have a simple question. How do you find your passion? How do you find your passion? Are you asking me to help you to find your passion or how I found my passion? I mean, what advice do you have for helping us to find our passions? Okay, here? I don't think every person in life is passionate. And I, I, I think that, uh, for example, some people are more passionate than others. Absolutely. And, and, and to find your passion, you need to dig within yourself and find out what is it that really turns you on. What is it that you really burn for? What is it something you want to climb the mountains? And, and, you know, that is the passion when you talk about creative passion. I'm sure there are people, I'm sure, there are people in accounting who is passionate about accounting also. I've not met one. No, I have. <laughs> so you can be passionate about left brain things and you can be passionate about creative things. I'm sure about that. It's what turns you on. What is it that you want to wake up every morning and do, and you're happy with a smile. How many people doesn't wake up every morning, look at yourself in the mirror, and just feel miserable? And we're not talking about poor people now, who maybe don't have a choice. I'm talking about people in this room. I've had two people coming up to me who I met before said to me, I have stopped, I quit my job because I'm going to start my own business. One is sitting in the front row here. I'm going to do my own thing. That's finding your passion. And maybe you don't have it when you're 30 or 25. Maybe it takes some time to find it. Did I answer your question? How 
how are you going to make sure in the next bubble that you don't get complacent? How will you challenge yourself when times are good? I pinch myself. Did you hear the question? How do I not become... I think, to be honest with you, I think we all... Um, I want to be a rock star, but I didn't. So now I'm starting DJing instead. It's too late. I can't be a rock star. I'm too old. My daughter just looks at me and they feel 21, 17, and 15 and say, Daddy, you're embarrassing. But in the music business, which I was a short while, I actually have CDs for you here, whoever uh, wants a music CD, because this is um, actually, we do our own compilations, and this is called West, West and East. I'm dyslectic, so I can play with words. And this one's called Ergasm. And when you read on the front, Ergasm here, and it's got approved by the ministry here, you know that they did not read the front page. Okay. <laughs> So, you, and you're going to get this, but I'm going to do a Bobby Say. I'm coming back to the, your question because it's about music, I'm going to answer that one. Uh, you, and you can get one each if you want, but you have a deal with me as you have the Bobby Say here. You are going to go home today and write down what you're passionate about. Then I give you a CD. Is that the deal? Okay. Because then at least I've done some change in life for, for you guys today. So in the music business, I say when someone is new and wants to become a musician, they are very humble. And then they become something, and they become arrogant, assholes. And then if they survive that place and go and become big, they become humble again. I think it's the same thing in business. I was working my mm ass off. And you're very tired. I was totally burned out 2000, 2001, when the things started to turn around. And when you get to that, it's like climbing a mountain. You, you get to that place and you say, oh, I can rest. And you know what it is when you've been training and you're going to rest? It's so hard to get going again. You're like stuck there. So that place called success is very, very scary because now you know what, how much work it was to get to this place. And, and then you say, am I going to lose that? So you are actually not willing to risk anything anymore. Well, you were actually willing to risk a lot when you started. And then you sit there in that place and then you're starting to be complacent. And then people tell you how good you are. And you get interviewed. And the cameras goes on. And suddenly you start to believe in yourself that you are actually much better than you are. And then you become lazy. And my insecurities was really laziness was that I wanted my managers to run the company. And that's nothing wrong. They should. They should be, uh, you know, we should be. A, but I stopped telling them when my stomach said, this is wrong. So, your question was, how do I know that next time? Because going from, from, from successful place right now to becoming great is what I really want to do. And I'm not going to reach great if I get stuck once again in my own world of uh, my own bubble. Let's put it that way. So I need people like my wife always do and others to kick my ass. Pinch it. Mm, whatever. So th I don't think there is an answer to it. I can screw up again. Um, thanks for the amazing talk, the amazing stories, the amazing concept. I have two questions for you, actually. Um, first is, what's your favorite book? And secondly, I'm just curious why you're barefoot. <laughs> I, the favorite book in the second one was? Why you're barefoot. Why well, I'm barefoot? Ah, okay. First one was uh, simple. There's a couple of books. Uh, three Cups of Tea. Three Cups of Tea, I can give you a name afterwards. Fantastic book about an American in Pakistan, or in Afghanistan, actually. A fantastic book. Um, anyone of you has not been on TED.com, I mean, for example, a fantastic book is uh, um, uh, Benjamin Sander. Um, um, uh, I give you the name afterwards, but Benjamin Sander is a music conductor from, from uh, uh, Boston Philharmonic uh, Orchestra. He writes about who are you as a parent if you don't get your children's eyes to shine? And who are you as a leader if you are not getting your employees' eyes to shine? That's your job as a leader. The other question where I'm barefoot is something I learned from a, a, a Jordanian actor who helped me. It's actually to keep me grounded so I'm not nervous. Because when you're full of energy, it doesn't matter how many times I do this, you will be pumped up. So I go and meditate before, and, and then and I can speak very fortunately. You can't even hear what I'm saying, so I need to... And to do that, you need to be grounded. And to do that, you need to get your energy out of your body. You have to be barefoot. And you're going to remember it also.
thank you. Should we, you saying it's over? No more question? Okay. My big mistake of Sweden. Uh, we opened two stores in Sweden. Huh? The failure. We opened two stores in Sweden. The Swedes loved us. We, I was a typical entrepreneur in mood. I said, I fix this. I can fix that also. But it was too far away. I didn't put together my management. I was in a time before the crisis where, when you couldn't hire people. There was nobody to hire because everybody got like three times the salary they were supposed to have. And we hadn't put together the management. And it was too far away. And you know, in Sweden, salaries are extremely high. So we just couldn't just turn this whole thing around. And uh, I only lost six to eight million dirhams, but that's okay. It's not okay, but that's life. It's a meaning for that also. Did I answer your question? That was the most honest answer I could give you. Okay, you want to see this, you can come forward. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>